Tonight, we have the pleasure of having a neighbor, an activist, a friend, and an amazing artist, Margaret Coswell. Um, she resides in New York, but as you know, she's an international well-known artist. She's the recipient of multiple awards, including this John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship, the Pollock Krasner Foundation, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the Foundation for Contemporary Arts Emer Emergency Grant. She's also a professor and um, an amazing um, lover of upstate New York. Um, and now I'm gonna pass the mic to Margaret. Thank you all. It's really exciting to be here this evening. Thank you, Raul, for your um, generous introduction and for arranging this evening and for inviting me. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised when we started planning this last year and excited when after it was um, canceled that we were able to reschedule it for this year. Uh, of course, this is a little bit different way of doing things, but I can feel the presence of many friends and family, so I'm very happy to be here tonight. And um, particularly to speak about my work in relationship to the New York water and aqueduct system and its magical journey as we are referring to it today. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to share with all of you out there some of this work and the journeys these projects have taken me on. I'd like to begin with thoughts which this excerpt from Langston Hughes' poem evokes for us. A poem written upon reflection of an experience while riding a train crossing the Mississippi River. I, it was a view evoking for him multiple social and cultural histories, which becomes for us a gift exploring what it is to know rivers. As an artist, I've been asking myself this question for the past 20 years, ever since stumbling upon what has become an ongoing exploration of rivers, listening to their stories and following their meandering paths. In 1984, in response to my experience of living in Hawaii for three and a half years, where colonialism's impact was still strongly felt, I made a brief foray into the investigation of rivers as a place where different peoples and cultures met, often colliding. This exploration became a mixed media installation titled after V.S. Naipaul's book, Abend in the River. It was exhibited at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in their gallery. It would be another 18 years before I approached working with rivers again, when river fugues began in Cleveland, Ohio in 2002 with Cuyahoga Fugues, a mixed media installation inspired by and incorporating generations of stories reflecting the life and dreams embodied in the Cuyahoga River. Since then, River Fugues has emerged as a series of individually unique site-specific installations, which utilize the musical structure of a fugue to weave together sculpture, video, sound, and drawing components. The resulting installations explore the interdependency of people, industry, and rivers in post-industrial cities. You might ask, why fugues? In music, by definition, a fugue is a contrapuntal composition in two or more voices built on a subject, a theme, that is introduced at the beginning and recurs frequently in the course of the composition. My reason for using the fugue is because of its flexibility as a conceptual framework, which can be applied to any set of components one is trying to integrate be they musical, sounds, voices, narratives, or images. All river fugues entail regional research, including road trips that follow rivers, tracing memories and loss in the landscapes they cut through. 
While the initial process for gathering materials parallels that of a documentary filmmaker, recording narratives with video, the work upon completion does not follow a linear descriptive narrative. Instead, my mentors are found in composers and poets whose use of intervals, sounds, and words create works which are provocative and ask questions rather than descriptive in order to provide answers. Now let's step back a bit. Why water, you might ask? How did this obsession with water and rivers begin? Actually, I'm sure most of us might answer that question with a shrug, since water is necessary for life. Its importance seems quite obvious. But how I began to focus on it as an artist began with the discovery of At the Hawk's Well, one of William Butler Yeats's Four Plays for Dancers, written in the style of the no drama of Japan. I was very excited by this discovery for many reasons, but initially it was because these plays draw on the cultural traditions of both Ireland and Japan. And since I grew up in Japan, this overlay of cultures in, in creating these memorable plays was very intriguing to me. I was also intrigued with the human longing for immortality, a longing which becomes the focus of At the Hawkswell and revolves around the search for the fountain of youth. In this particular human longing, and this, it is this particular human longing and the search for immor immortality, which I latched onto and began to work with in a series of pieces called Thirst, works which explore the idea of immortality being found in the waters of a particular place and or through particular rituals involving water. Here in Thirst, presented in Kansas City, I suspended ice in the form of buckets over three heated steel discs. So although the water was present initially in the form of ice, when the ice melted, it turned to steam when it hit the heated steel disc. Thus, like the fountain of youth, the waters were never accessible for drinking and immortality remains elusive. Although New York City was not searching for the fountain of youth, its search for water was critical for sustaining life in a city with an ever-growing population. In 2016, I was invited to create a project to be installed in windows of the Mid-Manhattan Library, which would be presented in 2017. This was a site-specific project created in the windows of the corner room along Fifth Avenue and 40th Street which is diagonally across the street from New York City main public library. As you can see in this image, the main library on Fifth Avenue is reflected in the windows of the Mid Manhattan Library. Given that 2017 was the centennial anniversary of New York City's aqueduct system and the 175th anniversary of the first Croton Reservoir, I decided it was only appropriate to take this opportunity to honor that site and create a piece which I would title Moving the Waters, Croton Fugues. As usual, this began with research. In addition to utilizing the incredible resources found in the New York City Public Library, I set about walking, exploring, and listening to people's stories about their drinking water. Early on, when the city first started running out of clean drinking water, New York City built the Croton Distribution Reservoir. This was located on the current site of the New York Public Library, the main one on Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street. What we see here is a view of the wall of the Croton Distribution Reservoir built between 1834 and 1842. Citing Wikipedia, the Croton Distribution distributing reservoir, as they call it, also known as the Murray Hill Reservoir, was an above ground reservoir covering four acres of land and holding 20 million US gallons of water. It supplied the city with drinking water during the 19th century. When established, the Croton Aqueduct was New York City's foremost water source. 
Filling began July 4th, 1842. Prior to construction of the aqueduct, water was obtained from cisterns, wells, and barrels from rain. The aqueduct and reservoir obtained their names from the water's source, a series of mostly underground conduits that would bring water from the Croton River in northern Westchester County to New York City. This and the other archival images, which I will share with you, are from the library's archival digital collection of images in the public domain. Here on the right is a partial aerial view of the reservoir. Its massive 50 foot high granite walls were 25 feet thick. Atop the walls was a public promenade offering panoramic views. Eventually, New York City's population grew to the extent that this Croton distribution reservoir was no longer adequate, so the reservoir was torn down in the 1890s. The city's main public library that we see there today on Fifth Avenue was built on the former site of that reservoir. Construction was started in 1897 and the cornerstone laid in 1907. However, if you wish, you can still see remnants of the reservoir in the basement of the main library. This photo of the Croton River was taken from atop the New Croton Dam, which is located in Westchester near Croton Harmon. Construction on the New Croton Dam was started in 1892 and was completed in 1906. To learn more about the new dam and reservoir, as well as the old Croton aqueduct system, I contacted the Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct and joined some tours. I would highly recommend this to you all. They are very knowledgeable and passionate about this bit of history. This dam is a stunning bit of architecture and part of its beauty comes from how it was built incorporating, incorporating the bedrock in the surrounding landscape. Of course, as an artist, I would also note what seem like peculiar details in the landscape, like this rowboat that you see, mysteriously and precariously perched on the edge of the spillway. Its presence has conjured up fantastical local lore because it's been there for years. So of course, this rowboat would have to be featured in my Croton Fugues as a layer in the history of the dam. During the period of my research in the summer and fall of 2016, I was able to witness the water levels in the reservoir and coming over the spillway of the dam, both during times of drought and times of near flooding. Here is an image of water rushing over Croton Dam post Hurricane Irene. In contrast here, what you are seeing and looking at are structures built during the drought of 2016 when the reservoir's water was not high enough to flow over the dam and the spillway. This too would reappear in my project. On one of the several tours I would take with the friends of the old Croton Aqueduct, I had this incredible experience of venturing down into this one section of the old Croton Aqueduct in Ossining. Here you see one of the weirs in this old aqueduct, formerly used to regulate the flow of water through the aqueduct tunnels. Many hikes and photographs later, I came to the critical point of needing to figure out what I was actually going to do in the space at Mid Manhattan Library and how. This project was an exciting challenge because it was to be all two dimensional. I was not in the comfort zone of my usual mixed media installations where I could take up all the floor and wall space in a room that I wanted. So this was good. This time my challenge was to find a way two dimensionally to, com to command the space inside the reading room and command the space in the large windows facing the street, uh, which were competing with the surrounding uh, architecture. Without video, I also wondered how I could reference the Croton Dam and Reservoir's history and this particular site without being locked into a single moment of a strictly narrative documentary image. 
For me as an artist, always with my extensive research comes the challenge of how to be true to the subject matter while transforming it into a visual artistic experience that is not didactic and instead takes us into considering the world from different perspectives. So about this time, I found myself remembering Wallace Stevens poem, the man with the blue guitar, the man bent over his guitar, a shearsman of sorts. The day was green. They said, you have a blue guitar. You do not play things as they are. The man replied, things as they are changed upon the blue guitar. And they said then, but play you must, a tune beyond us yet ourselves, a tune upon the blue guitar of things exactly as they are. Well, as Stephen's poem reflects, we have complicated and maybe even conflicting expectations of what art should be doing. For me to quote, play a tune beyond us, and yet of things as they are, end quote, seemed an apt challenge as I sorted through all the images and information I had gathered about the Croton Distribution Reservoir and Croton Dam. At about this point in the development of my project, I remembered an amazing exhibition that I had seen at the Metropolitan Museum titled Sultans of Deccan, India, 1500 through 1700, Opulence and Fantasy. And then I had an aha experience. I looked back at my notes and went back to the Met to study the paintings again and began to see them in an entirely different way. I began to notice the structure of many of these paintings and how often there could be one or two more or less narrative components in the center of the page, flanked by multiple panels and or borders of repetitive abstract forms, patterns, or text. When I began to dissect these paintings in my mind, I noted how these seemingly ornamental and repetitive patterns or abstract forms forming the borders often transform the reading of the narrative in the center of the page. Subsequently, taking the reading of all the combined components into the arena of poetry and even suggesting time. These paintings then led me to understand how I could create what became Croton Fugues. They informed my decision to work with multiple layers of panels to form a single image in each window. Combining multiple video stills in borders around a center main narrative image, I sought to transform the documentary image into a poem that could, would also be read in conjunction with other panels in the neighboring windows. Here, the now infamous rowboat appears still precariously perched on the edge of the spillway, making us consider how different quantities of water flowing over the ledge might dislodge and impact a possible journey for the rowboat. Here, my image of the system of pipes which were constructed during the drought of 2016 reappears. This is an overview of my installation as seen from the inside of the corner room of the old Mid-Manhattan Library reading room. I say old because now it's been renovated since 2017. Even without a video component, the fugue is still there with the repetition of images. A thin scrim separated the inside panels from the outside panels. All the panels are on archival, are, all the panels are archival digital prints on canvas. The views inside were completely different from that presented on the outside. In addition to the installation in each window, in the vitrines, I presented a series of prints and scrolls. I wanted to take advantage of the incredible resources the New York Public Library offers in their digital collection, which I referenced earlier. In my research, I came across some beautiful maps from the late 1800s of the Croton watershed and the New York City aqueduct system. I decided to make a scroll incorporating portions of these maps, juxtaposing these with video stills from the Green Ball's journey down to the city as seen in my magician video, which I'll share with you later. 
This is another scroll incorporating old maps of the Croton River and its journey juxtaposed to images from my ma magician video and the Green Balls journey in New York City's water. Both of these scrolls are archival digital prints on paper. In windows facing to the outside along Fifth Avenue, I installed a series of panels flanking the main entrance to the library. Perhaps this window most evokes the impact of the Indian paintings, which I study. In an effort to evoke time and movement, I have juxtaposed images of a magician's empty cups with the overflow of water from the dam and again to multiple views of the rowboat perched on the dam spillway. Here we have the appearance of a magician in the green balls. While it was not until later in the building of the Ashokan Reservoir that Waldo Smith, the engineer of the aqueduct system, which would bring water down from the Catskills, was to be hailed as a magician, it still seemed appropriate and permissible for me to take some poetic license and refer to the system of moving the waters from the Croton River in Westchester to New York City as an equally magical feat. As for the phrase moving the water, this was a phrase I learned in research while working on my Wyoming River Fuchs project. There in Wyoming, moving the water is a phrase which is used when referencing the process of flood irrigation. Moving the water seemed an equally appropriate description here in New York to refer to the diversion of waters through the aqueduct system, which brings water down to New York City. Here you see the installation of panels along the 40th Street side of the library. The center image on the left is my photograph shot inside Old Croton Aqueduct in Ossining. Surrounding panels are video stills from footage shot of a green ball moving around in water as water was filling up in a New York City sink. Again, the magician appears as he does throughout the piece, performing his magic with the green balls which follow the travel of the mountain waters to New York City's faucets. As you left the library, you could step back and once again, Note the overlay of history in the images of the Fifth Avenue windows with the reflection of the main library from across the street in the Mid Manhattan Library's windows. That being the original site of the Croton Distribution Reservoir. Now, my project Croton Fuchs was created in 2017. I have presented it to you first because chronologically the Croton Reservoir was built before the Ashokan Reservoir. However, my own work exploring New York City's water system actually began in 2014 with the Ashokan Reservoir. In 2014, when I was invited to have a solo exhibition at the Kew Art Foundation in New York City, I decided that this might be an opportunity to create a piece about the Ashokan Reservoir this project is of great personal significance because I've split the last 36 years living and working alternately in New York City and West Shokan, a small hamlet located next to the Ashokan Reservoir, one of the main reservoirs which provides drinking water for New York City. West Shokan actually used to be a town until 1905 when the building of the Ashokan Reservoir involved removing people's homes, farms, and cemeteries of 12 towns, all by eminent domain. West Shokan was one of the towns which was destroyed and submerged. Friends and neighbors in this community who knew I was an artist creating projects which explore rivers and access to water began to ask me why I hadn't created a piece about the Ashokan Reservoir. So I was, um, prompted that it was time. So I saw this exhibition at Q as an opportunity to create a piece which might increase New Yorkers appreciation for their water, where it comes from, and the sacrifices people had made for providing that for them, for New York City.
As usual, I began work on this project by listening, walking, and shooting a lot of video. Drawing and painting is also a parallel activity throughout. Here I share with you a few works on paper from Ashokan Fuchs. They are all watercolor and color pencil on paper. This is called Defiant Landscape. Fog lifting. Dawn. And dusk. Throughout my research, as I'm listening to many people's stories, some of these are integrated into the installations in one way or another, while others serve mainly to inform me and guide my thinking in the overall development of my work. Let's turn first to this series of narratives to hear what New Yorkers have had to say about their drinking water. While working on this project, I would often hang out in grocery stores in the bottled water section and talk with folks and record their stories as I asked them to tell me if they drank New York City tap water or if they knew where New York City water came from or why they were buying bottled water. Here are some of their responses. Well, it's off the way here. And it comes down on the bar. Water comes from the mountains. Guys, mountains, it rains and it collects and water. <laughs> Do you drink New York City water? Yes, I do drink. Straight from the top? Not at home. Why? Why not at home? Well, I don't know. She's used to buying water and I can store it. My best friend, she refrains from drinking uh, tap water because she's just like repulsed by it for some reason. Even though I tell her. Because uh, I, always, I know she what is, is um, good. It's no, you know, no combination, no make it regular sometimes because remember when I have a problem with another water, but I trust to be good. New York City water is very safe to drink, so I just drink tap water whenever I can and fill it up with my water bottle. Yeah, yeah I buy some water. Why? Well, because I think the water here is no the best. I don't know why, because uh, I don't know where, where the water comes from my house, you know. I don't know. Throughout my research, okay, moving on. As Ashokan Fuchs emerged, it became an elegy to the people of the Catskills who lost their land and homes through eminent mm. domain for the building of the Ashokan Reservoir. Using the musical structure of a fugue, this project is composed for a trio of videos in two water towers and one surveyor's transit. In New York City, if um, you are at the fifth story of a building, you are approximately equal to the level of the residents. I'm going to stop this just for a second because I want to introduce this. For purposes of this particular presentation, I'm including this two and a half minute video, which provides a bit more historical background on the New York City water supply system in regards to the Ashokan Reservoir and the water towers we see in the city. This is the kind of footage that would guide me in my thinking rather than be included in the actual piece. But I present it here in hopes it will be helpful for you in contextualizing this project. These, pro these narratives were recorded 
in the Olive Free Library and in the local cafe in West Shokan. Thus, you'll see he also hear some um, um, dishes clanking around in the uh, cafe portion, just to clarify what's going on. Yes, in, in New York City, if um, you are at the fifth story of a building, you are approximately equal to the level of the reservoir. So that the natural hydraulic pressure of water will just about get to you on the fifth story. Anything above the fifth story, you're higher than the reservoir. So natural hydraulic pressure is not going to give you the water from the reservoir. You need to pump it up. And um, that's an additional reason why we want to have those water tanks on the top so that in the middle of the night they fill up and they provide water to this to the um, stories that are higher than the fifth. People don't believe and realize about this reservoir specifically is the division that it caused in this town for not having a town center. The Ashoka Reservoir disrupted most, all of the town of Olive, some of the early, but the town of Olive was impacted. His right. father, I think, was like the commissioner, and he, he distributed the funds from New York City to people hated him. It wasn't his fault. I mean, but people just were so upset because they weren't getting the value that they thought they should get. It all came about because of the uh, filtra filtration avoidance determination, which is called the bag that the federal government brought forth. The city was required by the federal government in order to keep the city from having to filter their water, which would have been a multi-billion dollar expense. The federal government says to avoid filtration, put a land use management um, program together. So they w went out and they're buying, I don't know how many extra thousands of acres they bought here, but I know they own that mountain now, 106 acres, I believe. So the point of departure for this project became the water towers. Since they are kind of iconic um, visual link to the water that's coming from the Catskills to New York City, I began with the idea of imagining what it would take and what it would be like to see inside the water. Let me turn this down a little bit to see inside the water towers and watch them fill up and empty out with daily use of water. So I decided to make water towers with translucent tanks and project video of them filling up and emptying out. To accomplish this, I shot video footage in the industrial sink of the basement of our building that was completed in 1917, the same year as the New York City aqueduct system. This footage of the sink filling up with water and draining out was then rear projected onto the sides and bottom of the two ta water towers. The green ball entered the piece as a way to animate the water since water has no definitive form. With the green ball, the movement of the water in the currents is emphasized and subsequently becomes the thread in the other videos to link the movement of the waters from the Catskills down to New York City. Here, because we are not in the middle of this exhibition to experience layers it was as it was presented in the form of a mixed media installation, I've compiled a sampling of videos that would have otherwise been projected on the walls or if narrative videos presented in a separate part of the installation. I hope this offers you a taste of the layers of this project. This video is about five minutes.
of a bittersweet kind of beauty. When I was little, I, I always thought it was so pretty, and uh, but I didn't know anything about it too much. But then as I got older and realized that this person had to leave and, and these people aren't here anymore and the towns are gone, then it, then it was sad. My husband's family was uh, here for a long time, since 1853, and they had a boarding house. And as I understand it, when, when they built the dam, that drove the boarding houses out of business, more or less. Well, like the, um, the old timers reunion. That I, that I had said I went to the, um, that started right after the reservoir was finished because the people came together because they wanted to remember the stories and they wanted to remember each other and the families that were here before. So a lot of, um, a lot of families left and never came back. They did compensate them from what I, he told me, my father-in-law, for the loss of business, but not very much. But, but. Um, a lot of families left and never came back. Um, some left their, their very um, relatives. Um, in the Bushkill, there are a hundred graves, I believe, that are, that were unclaimed, but some of them were claimed. Um, you could you could fill out this form and uh, claim the bodies of of your friends too, friends and relatives, and take them to another cemetery if you you know could fill out the form properly. But that was um, that was sad. I mean, it was a lot of sadness. And I think Olive was probably harder hit than, I would say, West Hurley or someone because they took the center right out of the town of Olive when they built the reservoir. And uh, that was, uh, must have been very hard. Okay, moving along. Um, in 2016, moving the waters, the Shokin Fugues traveled to Woodstock, New York. And this was a significant location because Woodstock is just 11 miles from the Ashokan Reservoir. Additionally, Woodstock being a tourist town, I saw this as an opportunity to share with people from elsewhere a project which explores water, issues related to water supply and quality, as well as displacement, issues which are not unique to New York, but issues which people have to address and have addressed all over the world. In this three minute video, this is one of two wall projections in the Woodstock installation.
Back to the um, Woodstock installation, and that wall projection would have been on one of the walls there. Depending on the amount of space in the architecture, I see each exhibition as an opportunity to address different issues in different ways, which often may mean including new components. Generally, I install what I call my narrative fugues to be experienced and listened to discreetly, apart from the larger part of the installation with video projections on the walls. The reason for this is to engage the viewer in different ways. In a larger installation space, I prefer to have the viewers use their imagination in exploring the worlds presented through the videos, which do not include spoken word. Here in the Woodstock version of Ashokan Fugues, 24 inch diameter of spiral steel pipes were integrated into the installation and housed portable DVD players. These incorporated narrative fugues which viewers could listen to discreetly on headphones, then re-enter the larger installation with another layer of experiences. In 2018, while at Columbus State University as an artist in residence, I was invited to exhibit Ashokan Fugues in one of their galleries. Again, the project was adapted to the site. This time, I incorporated wall drawings of maps of rivers, lakes, and reservoirs in New York State. The floor I covered with pine straw, which transformed the acoustics in the room and altered the pace of the viewers as they walked across the floor of the gallery. Additionally, a bench was placed in the space inviting this viewer to sit and watch the two video projections and engage slowly with the work. In 2019, Ashokan Fugues was adapted for the Madeline Powers Art Gallery at East Strasburg University in Pennsylvania. In preparation for this exhibition, I learned about the Tox Island Dam project and the subsequent displacement of families, farms and homes for the Army Corps of Engineers proposed building of a dam that was never built because geological core samples proved that the land could not support a dam, but only after the families had been displaced. Subsequently, the Delaware Gap National Park was created in place of the dam. Learning of this history, I decided to incorporate what I call the Ashokan Displacement Narrative Fugues, created from the stories that people in this Pennsylvania community would also relate to. In an effort to activate this challenging atrium space, I utilized the atrium ceiling space as well as the floor. I also included a borrowed flat bottom rowboat, the only kind of rowboat allowed for use on the Ashokan Reservoir and then only for fishing purposes. This, along with the floor projection of reflections from the reservoir's water surfaces, served as a directional vehicle for viewing the 
the videos. Another version of the Shokin Fuchs was presented in an intimate space for an exhibition fundraiser event in Calicoon, New York. I think the simplicity and intimacy of this installation turned out to be quite special and maybe one of my favorite um, views, at least in this image. Now, finally, in closing, while New York City's search for water was not for the fountain of youth, it was in fact for sustaining life and there was magic. As previously referenced, Waldo Smith, the engineer of this system was hailed as a magician at the opening celebrations for the newly completed New York City aqueduct system. It was his vision and direction that would bring water down over hundred miles from the Catskills to New York City. So in closing, I'd like to show you this final three minute video what I call the magician video, which I've been re referencing all evening. It is a kind of tribute to Waldo Smith and the New York City aqueduct system and the magical history of moving water for New York City. Thank you, that's all. Thank you very much. Um, well, you want to take over? I'm unmute. 
Thank you, Margaret, for sharing with us this multimedia experience. Um, now we're going to open the floor for questions. Latonia, please take it over. Okay, uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, Yorchi Royota asks whether residents were given notice in advance to leave before their homes were demolished. Oh yes, of course, um, but not that much time. It's um, from what I understand, it's like maybe three months. Okay. Um, Warwick asks, um, you seem to be engaging primarily with things that humans have done to water or which water has, has, has done to their livelihoods, particularly wrestling with it and relocating it. Do you ever examine other ways that people use water, contemplate it and interact with it, especially as it passes through across landscapes or perhaps no longer does so because it's been wrestled away? Oh, absolutely. Um, I focused on these projects uh, tonight because um, I was invited by the New York City. I, they requested that I focus on these projects about the New York City water supply. And I have done, um, you can go to my website and see the other projects. Um, you know, I, I'm very interested. Um, there's not much water that we have not um, interacted with in some way. Um, whether even if it is respectfully looking over it or um, fishing from it or you know meditating by it, and there are um, in different projects there are different aspects of this relationship that are explored. Great, uh, our commissioner Pauline Tool asks, "What are you working on now?" Oh. A couple of different projects. Um, I'm still in the middle of a project on the Asequia system in New Mexico that I started um, a few years ago. And another project um, in Columbus, Georgia, where I was, while I was artist in resident there, I began developing a project. Um, the Chattahoochee River goes through uh, Columbus. And then um, most immediately, um, well, there's, there's another one I was starting last year during the pandemic on um, just my walks through the landscape and not necessarily, of course, there's always water because that's all a part of our lives, but um, it was, I was spending most of my time up in West Chocan. So I, I started working on a project there. Um, I guess it had a lot to do with time and the way that we interact with nature or just observing nature. Um, but uh, we're in the midst of, of transitioning from our wonderful, beautiful place where we live, um, community, neighborhood that I love so dearly here in Jackson Heights in Queens, New York. Um, and it's nearly breaks my heart to think that we're gonna be leaving. But uh, we're going to have to move um, and um, we'll be moving upstate where my main studio is. But um, I am I, I'm a walker. I, I walk almost every day. And so I decided that um, uh, I would start a project because um, related to Jackson Heights, I wanted to um, celebrate and honor this community um, that was the epicenter of the epicenter of the pandemic last year, if some of you may remember. Um, and um, many people in our community um, are essential workers, uh, one kind of another, and many lost their home, their, their homes, um, their jobs. Um, but what I have been most moved by is the spirit of resilience. And despite all of the um, challenges, I walk out my door and I walk down the street and there's music everywhere. So I'm working on the series of short videos that I hope to finish sometime in the next six months maybe. 
um, called Checks and Heights Elegies. And I might even post one of the first ones uh, up sometime soon on my website. So stay tuned. Sounds wonderful. Uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, your Chi asks, can anyone walk into the basement of the main library to see the remnants of the old aqueduct? Yes, yes. I'm trying to remember the name of the, I think they called it the South Hall downstairs in the basement. There's a, a presentation area, an auditorium. Um, you can ask anyone, you know, when you go to the library, you can ask the front desk and they'll direct you to it. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's great to have that remnant there. And you've answered some of this, but Catherine asks, where will your flow take you next out west? History of Hatchie Dam. History of the Hatchie Dam? I'm not sure. Um, out west. Um, often I'm, to be honest, <laughs> I go where I'm invited, um, uh, and I. But sometimes some things are, you know, if they're within my. Um, there's there's a certain financial realm within which I can operate without being in, invited. So um, most of the projects that have you saw have been commissioned. Or I was invited. Uh, to exhibit and so during the time I was working on it, they, I, um, and developing, you know, the, many of the projects would take two to three years, sometimes five years. Um, so there, you know, I'm sure I could uh, have multiple lifetimes working on many, many rivers all over. I did, I did do a project in China, which is very exciting. You can also see that on my, my website. It's, um, Zhu Jiajiao River Dreams. And you can also see some things on Vimeo if you just Google Margaret Coxwell um, or River Fuchs. Um, so I would like to go back out to New Mexico to finish working on the Asequia project. This is a very interesting um, irrigation system that was brought from uh, the Middle East, from Yemen up through Africa to Spain. And then when Spain came over to the, um, North America, they brought the Asequia system with them. It's a water sharing irrigation system. And it's really fascinating. It seems to me that it might have some, um, we could learn something from it for water sharing as we enter more and more in, um, to feeling the effects of global warming and experience drought in different parts of our country. Uh, so there's, there's something interesting everywhere. I mean, we can just look out the back door and something's interesting, so. Okay, and I think this will be our last question. It's from Joe. I'm curious if you see a relationship between water and how it is diverted with how we have dealt with our uh, Native American colleagues, the displacement or movement of water by hum humankind seems so connected to how we dealt with folks who really lived and honored nature, just a thought. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have not dealt respectfully, we have not honored um, treaties. Um, and um, the diversion of waters has been many, many times. I mean, you saw the impact of, of what happened in terms of the building of the dam for um, the benefit of New York City. And, you know, of course, my, my reason for creating this was not to make New York City people feel guilty, but maybe to appreciate their water more and also to realize how, this, how much people have sacrificed for it and, and everywhere um, where we have access to water. Um, you know, there have been communities that have been displaced or their access to water was, um, water was, as Joe pointed out, diverted um, as a part of the power structure. Uh, there's an interesting book, I can't remember the author, but it's called The Empire of mm, mm, uh, Empire of Water, I think. Um, and um, I can clarify that again later. 
but um, you know, irrigation systems were a, when somebody does and uh, has the control of how to move the water. If there's then uh, those who don't have the control are the ones who often lose access. So certainly, yes, we have that to do the Native American communities. I'm not sure. Think? Yes, it definitely answered the question. Raul, I'll throw to you. Yes. Margaret, are you currently involved in any activism to save water or nature or nature reserve upstate? Oh, good question. Um, interesting that you should ask, Raul. Uh, this spring um, in February, um, our community, the town of Olive, which because we just have these little hamlets um, our governing body is the town of Olive. And um, we got word that a company out in California had um, presented a proposal to build a um, hydroelectric pump station on the Ashokan Reservoir. <laughs> Um, and uh, they were going to, this pump station was going to involve um, building uh, a huge dam and um, another reservoir on top of, uh, they were looking at three locations. Um, several of them involved <laughs> clear cutting, um, Catskill Forest Preserve, which is protected by the state of New York. Well, it became clear that, um, I mean, we, we did not, our community did not find out about this directly because um, the company did, had not done their research and didn't seem to know anything about the area or the reservoir or that it was New York City water. Um, and the problem with this whole idea, not only could they not clear cut the Casco Forest Preserve, but they couldn't use the water in the New York City Reservoir without um, threatening the water quality as well as water quantity. Um, so it was pretty intense through the spring, but our community, um, it was amazing. Um, we had a Zoom town meeting that 300 people attended. And out of that, some other people far more, um, you know, savvy and doing all this. And, and someone who had written a book actually about hydroelectric uh, dams and um, um, many, many people kind of came out of the woodwork and organized. And um, through that, he successfully uh, submitted 300. We had a certain number of days to submit um, responses to FERC, uh, which is, I believe, abbreviation for Federal Energy Resource Commission, um, something like that. But uh, we had 30 days uh, or maybe it was 60 days to respond, but we lost uh, a lot of that time because um, uh, we didn't get, not our town didn't even get notified and, uh, until into maybe a month into this process. But our community organized and there were 3,000 letters and response and many communities um, uh, and um, nonprofit and environmental organizations came together and the state of New York and New York City refused to give permission. So we saved our water and New York City's water once again <laughs> and our town um, once again. And this is this, it's not because of sustainable energy uh, that we shouldn't be doing sustainable energy, but this um, project was not sustainable either. Um, it was going to use as much electricity to pump the water up the mountain as, uh, um, 
it was going to generate, it just wasn't going to be cost efficient. And so we want sustainable energy. Um, we have to look at that, um, but we have to do it in a way where it really makes sense. And it's not just saying you have a hydroelectric dam uh, or, and besides which hydroelectric dams are really not the um, state of the art right now. There are other options. Thank you so much. Um, are there more questions, Latonia? I don't believe so. Okay, Margaret, thank you so much. It has been an honor for me to work with you. Uh, the, comments on, the comments on the chat are amazing. I just share a link. If you would like to receive updates about our event, please uh, sign. Uh, share your information on the link with us. Uh, we have multiple events during the year. Um, they are all incredible. And uh, we would love to see you again. Thank you so much again, Margaret. Thank you to all the attendees. Thank you, Latonia. And do you have any more comments, Latonia? Oh, good night, everyone. Okay. Good night thank and you. thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all.